So I'm going to talk about application level DOS. I take there are a couple of network guys in the room. That problem is somehow solved. <coughs> I'm not an expert on network level. I work in the application layer. And I assure you that problem is not solved. Before we start, the boring part. So my name is Christian Follini. As you can see in the photo, I have a background in medieval history. I tried to earn my money defending castles. Didn't work out in practice, so I turned to service instead. And it turns out that's a lot easier to make a living. I defend web servers for a living, and I configure them, and I repair them. That's my job. I'm based in Bern, Switzerland, and I do a lot of Swiss projects. So application level DOS. In 2006, we encountered a new, what we thought was a very new type of attack that you could do slow, you could slow down a web server pretty easily from a single host, a single notebook. Nowadays, I'd, I'd use a smartphone and use very slow requests. That was 2006. We tried to raise a bit of awareness on the Apache mailing list. We talked about it on the mob security mailing list. And people would say, yeah, that's interesting, interesting topic, but there is no business case involved. And we would mention hacktivists, political protests, destruction, and would say, yeah, interesting, new topic. So there was nobody really from the developer community interested in the thing. And we were not willing to make a big announcement to release code, proof of concept, attack code and stuff. So we I uh, continued to watch the scene and see how this developed. Then a couple of years later, a tool ca named Slow Loris came out, released by American hacker R. Snake. Um, ironically, I t had talked to him about this as well, <laughs> but I was not really mentioning the real concept behind it. Just this could be a thing, and he said, "Yeah, it's not my, it's not my topic." <laughs> and then somehow he stumbled over it himself. He released Slow Loris. I was like, "Yeah, now now things are going to get interesting. We're going to see this in the wild." And yes, we did. <laughs> Another year afterwards, this came out. <laughs> this is the financial branch of Swiss Post making a press release saying they're going to end their business relationship with WikiLeaks' Julian Assange. And when we read this, we knew this is going to be fun. <laughs> Surprisingly, I was on one of those servers that day <laughs> because Swiss Post is one of my customers. So. After four years of thinking about this problem, I finally saw the attack. <laughs> that was a highlight in 2010. So within minutes, Swiss Post has been attacked by Anonymous, of course. Yesterday, uh, Mikko Hippon from Finland, he talked about these attacks. But he mentioned Visa, he mentioned American Express, he mentioned PayPal. But he forgot Swiss Post. I mean, that's not fair. Swiss Post has been on CNN, too. <laughs> yeah. And it has been, at least in Switzerland, all over the media. And uh, I'll let you watch this photo for a minute. I think this uh, explains quite a lot about this group. This is fairly chaotic, heterogeneous, a lot of different people. They seem to be somehow anonymous, somehow. Not really, <laughs> but a bit. And then they dress up, as you can see there. There are suits in here. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> they're in, they're in here for the fun. This is not a business case. They're here for the fun. They, they want to enjoy themselves. And if this band or this gang is coming after you, this is going to be quite a party. <laughs> and very chaotic. And if you have a big corporate website and a chaotic gang coming after it, you see that whatever they do, they will be able to harm you somehow, some way. And you will have a hard time to think clearly in the midst of this party <laughs> and all that throw at you. Of course, this is the modern age. 
Anonymous is fairly open. They're recruiting worldwide. They're recruiting via Twitter. They invite you to the IRC. So we went to chat with them. This is what they said. I think the first statement is the crucial one. They're not here for the money. All they want is destructing your money if you're a defender. They want to destruct your business with all they have. And this is how it turned out. I'm not able to tell you too much about Swiss Post side of it, but this graph went through the internal censorship, so I can show you that one. This is network link, Swiss Post. These are standard days. Say clearly there's a daily rhythm in it. This is Switzerland. These are local customers. They sleep during the night as with good Swiss citizens are supposed to do. Then you have a calm weekend, then you have a standard Monday, and then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon you have a press release. <laughs> so when the traffic is supposed to go down, it goes up. <laughs> and then what I think is a fairly nice <laughs> move by Anonymous, during the night they slow down. <laughs> But then, of course, on Tuesday morning, they hit Swiss Post with all they had. And there was an extremely busy day. Important here, this is the baseline. This is the total bandwidth. They hit the total bandwidth with the attack. And one note here, this is the remaining 10%, what you see. 90% of the attack is already filtered out by the ISP. That's the network, guys. They know how to handle this stuff. But the remaining 10% hit the servers, and they consume the bandwidth. Still within the big picture of the attack. Yes, please? Yeah, the, the colors are different ports. Uh, within the big picture of the attack, most of the attack, and I think most of the DOS attacks nowadays, they're still network-based. But application level DOS is on the rise within the big picture. And within the big picture, application level DOS, most of it is flooding HTTP requests. Most of it is hammering your website. A lot of it is people clicking reload on your website. That works on a large scale. And if you do this via SSL and you have a big political group behind it, that's a lot of requests. But I'm focusing on the small part within that's request delaying, slow lorries type. No hammering, but fairly smart, slow request. Yes? Yeah. Here we had a good defense. Here we took down the shield again because it was annoying in practice. And another guy tried it out put up the shield again for half an hour, he went away, and then the thing was settled. So, slow lorries or request delaying. You know the situation. You're in a shop, you're in a queue, and somebody in front is paying the bill with very small coins. A lot of very small coins. And the bill the bill can be big, and you can divide it with literally as many small coins as you want. There are three characteristics here. First, the lady here in front is consuming one cube. She's handing coins. She can do that. Is it illegal what she's doing? Anything that anybody think that's illegal? No. She's perfectly allowed to do that. This is protocol compliant. Second characteristic. The lady here isn't stupid. If somebody is doing this on purpose to you and you're at the cashier, then you'll realize, hey, 
somebody is trying to slow it down. And then you escalate, you alarm, blah, 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 talk to people. You can solve the problem. Because the lady at the cashier, she is not stupid. I take it your server is stupid. <laughs> at least my servers are stupid when this happens. Third characteristic. You're not killing a big shop chain with this attack. You're slowing down a queue, you're slowing down 10 queues, you're slowing down a shop, but you're not able to raise a nationwide attack on a shop chain or a worldwide thing. And if you do, there are people around to help you with it. Well, let's go to the online world. Swiss shop chains, let's take Migros, for example. They have a lot of shops, but they have one online shop. Swiss Post, one online banking. I admit a lot of queues, but a single URL. And the server was very stupid. But the same thing as in the real world, slow requests are protocol compliant. But I mean with this is with a protocol compliant slow request, you can do you can have a catastrophic effect on an online server. While a standard sit in at a bank or in a shop is harmful, a bit of media attention, but it is not really a problem for the shop for the com company behind it. Not like that in the online world with a single web shop, you're pretty much screwed if this happens on your site. Here is why. This is the Apache web server's status page. That's mod status. I told you the, ca the lady at the cashier is not stupid. That's Apache. In default configuration, he is pretty stupid. Here where the question marks are, and the reading, this is where the information should be. But there is no information. He doesn't see it. He's blind. This is when the attack starts. Five, five seconds afterwards, there is no page anymore. He's no longer able to deliver the status page to you. So at first, you see fairly nothing. Afterwards, you're completely blind. One thing you see here, this is the CPU column. Zero. No CPU happening. If you look at the I.O. on the server, not a flat, no I.O. If you look at the log files of the server, nothing. No requests coming in. The only thing that gives you a clue is netstop. TCP connections, yeah, a lot of TCP connections, but nothing happening. In the slow lorry's case, and slow lorry is only a proof of concept, you see a lot of TCP connections from the same server or the same client. So one IP address, 2,000 connections, yeah, that's a, sure ga that's a fair game. But in the distributed case, of course, you have no ad attacker with more than two or three TCP connections. And that's why it's, it's very difficult to divide between the good and the bad guys. So this is the base problem, and this is what people tell you about it. Even Ristich, a uh, famous Apache security guy, would tell you, in his big book, Apache Security, one paragraph about application level DOS, very difficult. <laughs> Thanks, Ivan. <laughs> we found much as much as that. Uh, our snake handed in the bug report regarding slow lorries to Apache. They would say, yeah, we expect that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Apache actually has um, a DOS um, uh, page. Well, uh, when I read this the first time in 2006, I would say, yeah, that's, that's the thing you try to do while you watch your server die. But nothing on the page helps you so much. Slow Loris is sure death for an Apache, at least when Slow Loris, the tool came out. Meanwhile, there's been a bit of movement. Uh, I'll come to this afterwards. So back to the core of the problem. We have a problem of strict differentiation here. I repeat the quote, defense is about telling good traffic from bad traffic 
when the bad traffic mimics or looks like the good traffic and you're blind. Difficult. Uh, as very often the German term is a bit better, it's Trennschärfe. You divide the good guys on the one side and the bad guys on the other side, clear cut, without cutting the feet of the good guys. False positives are mean here. And false positives are a big problem. So, defense. You have to know that self. By the, by the way, that's a medieval quote for medievalists in the room. You have to know yourself before you can defend. You have to know your architecture. DOS attackers will look for bottlenecks in your setup. You can wait until they found the bottleneck or you can try to find the bottleneck yourself. You have to know the protocols. Here we're talking about HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, everybody knows HTTP, but you really know it by heart. HTTP looks like a very simple protocol, but it is not. HTTP is really, really complicated in the details. Take, for example, HTTP Keep Alive. Most people will tell you that HTTP Keep Alive is a good thing, but now think about the attack type here. HTTP Keep Alive makes TCP connections last longer. HTTP is a stateless protocol where you would say, ha, request, response, gone. And now HTTP Keep Alive transformed this into a protocol with open standing connection. HTTP Keep Alive makes a, makes, uh, a good customer look like a slow loris attacker on the network level. That's pretty bad. I'm no friend of HTTP Keep Alive for other reasons as well. Uh, what I want to say is, even if it's a simple protocol, you have to know it by heart if you want to defend yourself. Because the attacker, they will find a weak spot in your setup in the protocol. You have to know your application. The problem here is, nowadays, people don't know applications. They install them. It used to be difficult to integrate applications. And during the integration process, you would learn the application. But nowadays, when things are so simple, you just install and it works. And then the attack comes, and then you start to learn your application. You look at the log files probably for the first time, and you're not even sure what is attacker here and what is valid customer. So you need to know the application when it's in mint condition, when there is no attack going on. And then when the attack comes, you see, ah, this is bad behavior. This is not supposed to happen. Don't start to, to make friends with your application during an attack. Know your customers. Uh, you've seen the network graph, Swiss Post. Swiss Post knows uh, the customers fairly well. One thing I can tell you here, they are Swiss. That's, that's, that helps because they're local customers. They have local IP addresses. Big, big advantage. If you're uh, operating worldwide or globally, things are a bit more tricky. Uh, what Swiss Post also knew, customers work during the day. They go to sleep in the night so we can repair a service during the night. And tomorrow we have a new game. Know your allies and their phone number. Chances are that you're not confronted with the US attacks every day. There are people who specialize in that. You should make contact with them. If you're a big Swiss corp, Melanie is your friend. That's the federal side in Switzerland who helps the big sites. Unfortunately, they are not helping the small sites. But that's a financial problem on their behalf. But you should know a phone number where to turn to when the shit hits the fan. You have to know your tools. In the end, you defend with tools and a selection of tools. You're not defending with a support contract. You're defending with somebody on the server who knows the application, who knows the setup, and who knows how to combine things to build a defense. There is no silver bullet here. There is nothing that install once, problem solved. You have to be adaptive in your defense. You have to analyze the attack and then try to build up a defense against it. 
And the, this uh, means in the end that you need an expert on site and he has to know you, your site very well. And then, of course, you should have a defense plan prepared. As we had found out about this uh, attack factor in 2006, we had ample time to build up a defense plan. Uh, management was not very fond of the defense plan, but at least we had it in the drawer. And when the attack came, we could pull it out, present it to management, and this helped a big deal. Because without a defense plan, what I call uh, a headless chicken mode kicks in. <laughs> Anonymous is already very chaotic, and if you're very chaotic too, then it all crumbles down. And then know your enemies. In the anonymous case, this is easier than with other threats. They're public. They announce their t attack tools on Twitter. Look, I'm, r I'm launching Slow Loris now. I'm doing Rudy. I'm doing Loic. Please join. That helps. So we have the knowledge now. Let's start with the basic defenses. Think about using an event-based web server. The point with Apache is that Apache binds a server process, or rather a server thread, to a TCP connection. So the number of TCP connections defines how much server thread or RAM you will need, how much RAM is going to be consumed. That is not very smart nowadays. That's the way Apache works. The event-based Apache branch is experimental and doesn't do SSL, so that's not an option. You could turn to a different web server who's handled this in a more smart way, Nginx, Light HTTP, may maybe even ISS, but they have other limits, of course. I'm still on Apache because it's different advantages. Then often an option, think about routing through an external specialist. There are people around who know the OS very well. Chances are, if you're a Swiss bank, you're not supposed to route your traffic through an external third party. But it's an option for some people. Then come back to HTTP Keep Alive, understand HTTP Keep Alive, and know what it really means to your site. And decide if you really need it. I usually say, we don't need it. And then somebody comes up and say, we absolutely need it because the application is so crap, and then we enable it. Lower your timeouts. Uh, Apache and other web servers come with huge, very big timeouts. For me, three seconds like, sounds like a decent value. Not 300 seconds like the default, three seconds. This works in practice. Three seconds is all it takes. Then use mod rec timeout. Come back to that afterwards. Standard. Apache module now, mod rec timeout is the Apache response to slow lorries. Look at the mod QoS, that's a Swiss module by Pascal Buchbinder. That's cool, mod QoS. If there is something fairly close to a silver bullet, it's mod QoS. I think that's the most versatile thing in this regard. GeoIP. GeoIP is fun. If you look at a Netstat, then you have tons of IP addresses. They're just numbers. But adding the country, the location to an IP address is so much more information. If you know where your customers are sitting and suddenly you have hundreds of connections from, that's all Malaysia, then you know that something is amiss. And GeoIP is so easy with a single package on a database. It's a great thing. Down to the basics, nets.tcp dump, even if it is encrypted traffic, these two tools help a big deal. Uh, IP blacklisting, that's what you want to do. In the end, it turns out you want to blacklist on the server. Blacklisting on the perimeter, shut out people, is a good thing, but in big corporations, that's not so fast. That's difficult to set up. The def server should be able to defend himself. We were uh, reluctant first but even in this attack, in the end, this is what worked very nicely. The server has to be able to attack and defend himself, and then you can propagate the IP addresses somewhere out on the perimeter, ISP probably. Look into mod security. Even if it is not an anti-DOS tool, 
it has a couple of interesting directives. Uh, look into mod vector, it's another interesting module which might help. And a general idea coming back to HTTP. We're at the bottom now, unfortunately, sorry. <laughs> so think about your architecture, think about your application, and then you realize, hey, for unauthenticated users, all we have are small requests. But within the application, once they have authenticated, we have file uploads. That's the difference. There is no point in accepting big post requests beyond 100 bytes for a non-authenticated user. All you can accept for a non-authenticated user is a login form with 100 bytes in the post. But I take it, most servers will actually accept up to the limit, like one megabyte because of the file upload. But that's stupid. You should try to separate these things. Non-authenticated user talking to the whole world. My good users, they have credentials. That's how you should build your service. So basic defense nowadays, you work with mod security, limit the number of connections. In the header phase, we accept five connections for a single IP address. In the body phase, we accept another five connections. So if we have a slow loris attacker who will always stay in the header phase, he's out. But slow loris is only a proof of concept. That's not distributed. Against a distributed attack, this won't work. And another problem, corporate proxies don't show individual IP addresses. They do net, of course. So you have big corps connecting to your corporation, and they all use the same IP address. You shut them out with this. Doesn't really work in practice so well. Mod rec timeout, I've mentioned that. That's the Apache standard defense nowadays. I think that's better. This is number of connection. This is length of a connection. He would say for the header phase, one second. Body phase, 30 seconds in total. And afterwards, there are more quirks in this command. Let's say after every 30 seconds, we want to see so and so many bytes. Problem here, authenticated and non-authenticated users are in the same bucket. Second problem, slow mobile clients. The, can, the customers with the biggest problems on the end of the world with a very slow connection, they need your support and not being locked out from your site. So these tools, problem is they're putting all the customers in the same bucket and everybody gets to have the same length and number of connections. Now you combine lots of different tools. Uh, one good thing, for example, just as a hint, you ha I said you have a lot of Netstat connections, but nothing in the access log. There's a delta in between. If somebody does a lot of connections with you, but never a request, chances are that he's an attacker, isn't it? What you have to do is combine the two tools. And this is where the server kicks in. Up to now, you could say, yeah, we do this on the firewall, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No. The server is the only guy who knows the access log. He's the only one who knows what is actually happening here. And if it is encrypted, that's even more true. Other DDoS tools, they do full requests, but then they don't fetch follow-up pages. Anonymous Loic tool works like that. They hammer the index page all the time. But if somebody requesting the index page not getting the CSS files, that's not a valid customer. Maybe a crawler, but not, nothing else. JavaScript image files are the like. That gives you an indication that could be an attacker. But you already see that could be false positives. But still, that's an indication. General thing, and for me, that's a very good indicator. You take the lifetime of all the TCP connections to your application, and then, then calculate the median. And if the median runs out, then you're under attack. 
because as I told you, you're very blind when you, during the attack. But that's a value which tells you, usually we, we see four seconds of a lifetime, and if we hit 35 seconds, chances are we're under attack. Because otherwise it's very difficult to actually tell if you're under attack. Good. And then the advanced stuff, monitor all these logs together, combine them, and then identify the attackers and kill them. Fail to ban is your friend here or any sort of other blacklisting script. So, and I'm presenting to you a script which does that. It's called Flying Frog. If slow lore is already a very stupid name, I came up with something even more stupid. <laughs> Imagine a uh, flying frog. That animal actually insists, exists, like a slow lorry that actually exists. Even a flying frog exists. And he hovers over the TCP connections and the log files, and then he identifies something. He picks it out like a frog eats a mosquito, very selectively. <coughs> Features. Our frog is monitoring the SYN requests, so he builds up his own netstat table. Problem is, a modern on a Unix system, it will not tell you how old a TCP connection is, at least not to me. So if you want to know the age of a TCP connection, you have to do your own statistics. And the frog will always calculate the age of TCP connection it sees. And it will also monitor the authentication log or the access log of the application and see who, which IP address is able to provide credentials. These are my customers. Everybody else is under suspicion. And then he will, as I said, report the median connection lifetime. So overall, globally, ooh, shifting, median connection lifetime goes up. Alarm, we could be under attack or not. And he will report client IPs with, with more connections than the limit allows. He will do the same thing here. But his limit is configurable. Come to that. And then he will also report IPs with connections that are older than the limit allows. That's the mod rec timeout thing. Again, you're able to do very granular configuration to this. So these limits and conditions can be configured very easily. That's the config file. So we say, basically, you get 10 connections. Client IP address, you get 10 connections. But if you're coming from Switzerland, you get 20. And if you're authenticated, you can have 100. Corporate proxies will authenticate themselves. They will have requests or sessions with authentication. <coughs> and immediately, these IP addresses are allowed 100 TCP connections. So chances to lock a big corporate out from my corporate reduce without actually knowing who the corporates are. And then the individual timeouts, he would say, you get five seconds for your request. Via SSL, I give you 10. If you're coming from Switzerland, I give you 20 seconds to fulfill your request because we privilege local customers. If you're authenticated, then you can do your file uploads. I'll give you 50 seconds. And if you're authenticated and you're coming from Switzerland, I give you 100 seconds to, to finish your, your connection or your request. And you see now, now we get granular configuration. We can divide our customers, our clients. And this is what helps. And like this, we can do a strict differentiation. And this has to be done on the server, because only the server is able to look into the application and see who is actually authenticated and who's not. So yeah, uh, this script, this is where you can download it. Today is the first day of the release. Uh, I consider it alpha code quality. This has been tested. This has already uh, been used during a penetration test as a defense. Helped. 
And if some of you guys would download that and provide me some feedback, that would be fun. And uh, yeah, that's it for my talk. Then still, uh, I've announced in, uh, in the program that I will also talk about medieval castle defense. So for the medievalists amongst you, <laughs> footpaths and staircases within towers in medieval castles are usually clockwise. Anybody know why? Yeah. Yeah, and you have, to and you have the disadvantage of your shield facing outside. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> so that should be covered by now, and I'm open to questions and feedback. So the first, um, the first thing we were thinking about is NAT, of course, and you already covered that. Uh, did you have problems with uh, whitelisting NATed IPs like, uh, I don't know, GPRS uh, gateways or stuff, where you have both authenticated and uh, pot potentially malicious clients? And uh, how do you, do you just assume that there's few enough of those uh, which have both um, good and bad clients behind them? Or how do you counter that? OK. Uh, the attack we saw, individual attackers were not the problem. So if a couple of attackers sneak into Switzerland, it could happen theoretically. We're still not in the co European Communion, but there could be attackers amongst us. Actually, we had 25. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that's not the problem. The problem is anonymous operating globally. And there have been thousands of them, and a few individual ones, let's say, individual false negatives are usually not the problem. And if I see somebody with 1,000 TCP connections, that's fair game, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. More questions? Maybe for another 10 minutes. <laughs> Global banks. No. <laughs> No, um, I can uh, say here, you need to combine these tools. You need to come up with an individual approach to try to think of it. I mean, the Geo IP is very, very strong. I mean, if you take this and exclude the Geo IP stuff, it's still very good to make it, to put non-authenticated users and authenticated users in different bags is still very, very strong. And people are not doing that. I mean, the IDS and the firewall is not able to do that. The server has to do it. And the server has not been instructed up to nowadays. I mean, people are not using these agents on their servers. And I mean, maybe application level DOS is not the most imminent problem. I mean, the risk of somebody being hit by that is extremely small. But then uh, we would not ante anticipate that. <laughs> you never know when you suddenly hit like a thunderstorm, and then you have the attack. So it's, it would say uh, to preparation of the defense is not high priority, because it's very, not very risky. But when you're actually hit, then it's really bad. And that's, uh, that's, a really, that's a mean risk situation. Low chance, big impact. It's hard to get money for situation. Yeah. Yes? Again, um, there's, um, there has been work trying to fingerprint um, HTTP clients based on their um, the uh, what headers, request headers yes. they put and which um, order they are in, um, especially if people claim they are IE and then they're not. Um, do you use something like that to try to differentiate good from bad customers or good from bad requests as well? Or has, hasn't this been necessary yet? <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I did uh, a similar presentation in Swiss Cyberstorm in, in May, and Dara mentioned that. Mark Ruff, who just had the other talk in the other session, did something like that. Ivan Ristich, the Apache security guy, and the initial D 
developer of Mod Security. He does SSL client fingerprinting. Uh, all I've seen so far is experimental. But I uh, mean, yeah, that kind of works, doesn't it? Obviously, it should work. Loic attack tool will have an own fingerprint. But then, I think that's, that's uh, a dead road pretty soon. Because A, of course, the attacker can I imitate than the browser. And the modern tools, they run in inside the browser. So the next generation Loic of the anonymous network is JavaScript-based. And that work in practice, this works like join the attack here. You're on, their on the website, and you're part of the attack immediately. And JavaScript, in the background, executes the attack via a remote distributed structure. You're in, the, in a voluntarily botnet by clicking on the URL. And then there is no fingerprint anymore. Then you're down to uh, stuff like, where I have it here, done. Don't fetch follow-up CSS, JavaScript image files, uh, bad request structure. Other ideas are get requests in relation to post requests. In an application, there should be a standard ratio between the two, if you know the application. Like 90% should be get requests. But if a client is doing only post requests, then that's a very special client, isn't it? Maybe there are false positives, of course. But uh, this is not a defend, defense which you have always active. This is when you come under attack, then you fire up the shield, and then you accept a couple of false positives. Yes, please? You had a question, didn't you? No, you didn't. Christian? Get requests and post requests on like modern, um, like for instance, Google Web Toolkit applications, which usually handle all the AJAX stuff via post requests. So that might not be the key issue to distinguish. For the that ratio. depends on your application, yeah. and you have to know your application. Yeah. Some of these ideas work, some ideas won't. It really depends. Yeah, if there is nothing else, I'll say uh, close it. Thanks for listening.